President Adesai, Excellencies, members of the diplomatic corps, colleagues from all around the world, including our webcast and YouTube audience, members of the wider global research network, ladies and gentlemen. It is both an honor and a privilege as director of the wider institute of the United Nations University to warmly welcome you all to the 17th wider annual lecture. Each year, an eminent scholar or policymaker who has made a significant contribution in the development field delivers this lecture, a key event in our calendar. This year, in collaboration with the Crisis Management Initiative, CMI, we are especially honored to welcome, or welcome back, if you wish, Nobel Prize winner, member of the Group of Elders, and key player in the creation of WIDER, President Artasari. Please do accept our most sincere thanks for accepting the invitation. Your address today has a very special importance to the UNU WIDER Global Network. We are a small institution, actually very small, in international comparison, especially compared to our U.S. counterparts, which have far larger financial resources. Nonetheless, over the last few years, we have managed to position wider as number six in a very competitive global ranking of international development think tanks. And in Europe, we are in the very top. You, who played a critical role in setting up wider, must share the credit and we hope some of our pride in this achievement. We hope that you feel that we have managed to stick to the guiding principles you are responsible for laying out nearly three decades ago. We continue to strive to provide a wider perspective and thinking on development issues and the evolving challenges the global community is facing. President Adesari, I warmly welcome you, and I'm happy to introduce a greeting to you and the wider audience today by a fellow Nobel laureate who, with you, played such a criti critical role in creating WIDER and establishing the intellectual tradition on which WIDER continues to build. President Adesari, I give you Professor Sen. Well, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to greet um, uh, President Marty Atisari, who I'm very privileged to have known and has as, as, as a friend, and whose influence in the building up of WIDER right from the early days when I was involved with WIDER has been extraordinarily important, inspiring, and uh, deeply influential. Um, the, uh, of course, uh, Professor, uh, President Atisari's role in the world is widely known and very deeply admired, but in a small way that applied even to WIDER, which was a new institution, new kind of a uh, place uh, where research will be done, as the name indicated, or an acronym WIDER. Uh, it uh, was trying to take a wider, a broader, a more inclusive view of the world. And the pursuit of development studies has to be done, it was determined at that time, uh, on a much um, a broader basis than was in, indeed uh, conventional. And in that, uh, a part was enormously uh, important part was played by um, uh, uh, Mati Atisai as one of the principal advisors and influences in the early days of WIDER. And in particular, some of his concern, including the one which you will be talking about today, I understand, namely um, the importance of equity and, and, um, and uh, the uh, issues of fairness in, in the process of uh, world, uh, the development of the world, and, and in that context, both 
peace and prosperity. Uh, really, well, among the major issues we try to deal with, there's a sometimes a kind of um, artificial um, barrier raised thing, you know. Uh, economic expansion is one thing, but um, equity is yet another. But that's not the right way of thinking about it, one thing. You don't get much economic expansion uh, if you are troubled with problems of inequality within as well as discontent, which often can come when some people's lives are not going well at all, despite other people's lives uh, rolling forward. Now, uh, uh, President Atisari has been very concerned with these issues for a very long time, and I remember wonderful discussions with him, and actually with his wife, Eva, also, uh, on, on these subjects when we were trying to look for a vision for wider. And I think that question remains alive today. I was just thinking about it because I've published recently a book on India. And one of the issues is that the high rate of economic growth of India has not translated into the bettering of the lives of the bulk of the population. And in some ways, the concern is not just to view it artificially separated, namely you have the growth and how you can then make people's life better. But people's life better is part of the engagement of which growth is also a byproduct. As I think Adam Smith noted well, well over 200 years ago, that there's nothing as important as having a healthy, uh, educated workforce with, uh, who can cultivate their skill, who can improve on their skill, and who have a sense of satisfaction in the, in the, with their lives in the community, including, uh, he discussed particularly such issues as appearing in public without shame, participating in public discussion. Now, these have been among the central concerns of the entire United Nations effort, of which, of course, Marty Atisari has been a central figure in, 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 in recent days, um, in recent years, decades, actually. Um, and I think these issues remain. I mean, in the context of India, at the moment, the people are talking about how does the growth rate have come out to be, uh, as, how, how is it not sustaining itself? Well, there are all kinds of problems, and people point to the failure to do deal with the physical inco infrastructure. But there are similar issues of the social infrastructure, too. That is, the potholes on the road are very easy to see, but potholes in our healthcare and education system are not so easy to detect. So I think the entire approach that, um, um, beginning with um, uh, director Lal Jarvadana, who was the first director of WIDA, and many of us who were trying to advise him. I think of uh, other advisors like um, uh, Steve Marlin and, uh, and, uh, and others, and, and also a um, uh, uh, lot of the people working in WIDA at that time, like S.R. Osmani. We were very concerned about how make equity, make equity a part of the picture, not a detachable whole to the story of human progress. To see that human progress has to be understood in terms of what it does to the lives of the people, the well-being and freedom of the people, and to understand how the well-being and the freedom of the people feed back in making growth sustainable, not just environmentally, that too is very important, but also sustainable socially. And I, my one deep regret is that I can't be there today and listen to uh, uh, Mati Atisari speaking again. I've, I've had that pleasurable experience many times. I feel very deprived that I won't be able to have that pleasure now. But uh, I take this opportunity of um, uh, wishing everyone a wonderful time, and I minimally demand a full report as to what happens today. <laughs> we shall make sure that report is provided. President Adesari, may I ask you to take the floor? Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, 
I want to express my gratitude for being able to participate and hopefully contribute to the annual lecture series of the wider institute. I'm extremely pleased that Finland some 30 years ago decided to express a clear political support for the recently established work of the UN University. As I was also always very supportive of the idea of Finland hosting WIDA, speaking today here in Helsinki makes this occasion a very special one for me. I still remember well the discussion around the establishment of the UN University in the early 70s and the WIDA Institute a bit later on. The fundamental argument at the time was that there was a need for sustained and international effort to produce high-level research and in-depth understanding on how global economic system works and how does that affect on demanding needs of developing countries at the time. And as we all know from those days of the 80s, that system has changed and evolved a lot, even dramatically in some sense. And at the same time, the fundamental task and mandate of wider institutes has remained the same. The demanding need to understand and sometimes even guide the global economic system or systems, as one might nowadays argue, is as timely as ever. Even though we have managed to move towards the poverty reduction goals at the global scale, we still have a lot to do in terms of understanding what poverty really means in the 21st century. The basic challenge for the researchers and political decision makers all around the world is still the same than in the 70s and 80s. As societies and their dynamics constantly change, the way we see and interpret the nature of poverty and growth also changes. This is not only an interesting theoretical discussion around the economic paradigm and models. Our understanding of economics, poverty and growth deeply affects the choices we make and the political practices we choose when combating the everyday challenges of inequality, whether at the level of global decision making, national or regional policies, or even at the level of smaller local communities. My personal experience on these challenges goes back all the way to the early 60s, when I, for the first time, encountered serious development policy challenges in, when I was working for Swedish NGO, which had a marvelous name, Central Committee for Swedish Technical Assistance, and I was sent to Pakistan. The observations I made at the time have been guiding me throughout my whole career. Unless we can solve the very challenges of deep inequalities in any given society, we can never achieve the Kantian vision of perpetual peace. And the question is, as it has always been, how do we do it? Dear friends, one of the thought-provoking articles I have read during the last few years was the article by one of the initiators of the wider institute whom we just heard, Professor Amartya Sen. In the New York Review of Books he wrote some slightly over two years ago an article in which he compared critically the quality of life in India and China. The two giant economies with impressive numbers of growth in terms of GDP. In sense thinking, which I fully endorse, the significant question is not only how we achieve economic growth, but what the government does with the public revenue that is generated by economic growth. So when assessing the celebrated growth figures of India and China, it is not the question of financial surpluses or the amount of investment we should only be discussing about, but their effect on people's quality of life. In sense comparison, the conclusion is clear. 
China wins hands down India basically at all fronts of societal development. Let me take few examples from his article. If you look at the life expectancy in China, it is 73.5 years, in India only 64.4 years. The maternal mortality rate is 230 per 100,000 life births in India, 38 in China. China's adult literacy rate is 94% compared with Indians 74%. Literacy rate for women between ages of 15 and 24 in India is not much above 80 percent, whereas in China it is 99 percent. Uh, and if you look at children, the situation is even more dramatic. A very substantial proportion of Indian children are undernourished compared with a very small proportion in China. And only 66 percent of Indian children are immune decided with triple vaccine as opposed to 97% in China. Please don't get me wrong. By stating these facts, I certainly am not proposing that the overall societal and political system in China would somehow be better than in India. In terms of democratic participation, India has been showing the way for long. Freedom of expression, political participation, and vivid civil society are all crucial parts of modern India. It is also obvious that China has to open political space for wider political decision-making and participation in the future. But let's be frank. Something in this comparison does not fit into the way we are used to think. Strengthening democracy does not automatically ensure that economic growth will benefit the people. In the same article, Amartya Sen continues to challenge the automatic meaning of GDP to the well-being of people. In comparison between Bangladesh and India, it becomes obvious that in Bangladesh, the country whose GDP per capita is about half of that of India's, many indicators tell us that the basic requirements of good life are better off than in India. Life expectancy, the proportion of underweight children, the mortality rate of children under five, literacy rates of both men and women, vaccination rates, etc. All the indicators tell us the same story. Bangladesh is way ahead of India. Explaining factors for this are many, out of which the role of liberated women and politically active and strategic civil society in the country certainly are not least ones. And all this has something to do with the egalitarian principles and policies. Dear friends, I have become more and more confident that we have to start seriously challenging our conventional ways of thinking when it comes to the relation between economic growth and quality of life, or development, if you wish. And this does not only concern developing countries or emerging economies, but, but also the Western world, Europe and US in particular. But the good thing is that we also have some good examples of egalitarian policies from which we can learn from. Let me take a look at some of the things we have learned here in the Nordic countries. To put in a nutshell, the basic idea of a Nordic model is to pursue universal welfare policies, which means that public programs, services, and transfers are designed to serve everyone living in the country. Democratic principles and the rule of law are cornerstones for our everyday political decision making. We believe in the basic tenets of fair society, which treats everyone on an equal footing. This society has relatively long roots already now, which cannot be said about many other Western societies. As the recent article in The Economist portrayed if you want to experience the American dream, go to Sweden. <laughs> the recent study which I initiated and my organization, Crisis Management Initiative, will shortly publish, actually it's coming out next week, 
shows it clearly that economic growth alone is no longer a remedy against poverty, deprivation and other social ills. Naturally, we need environmentally and socially sustainable economic growth. But what matters is not only the aggregate level of national wealth, but also how the wealth is used within a society. Indeed, in countries with more equal revenue sharing, there's a more trust between people, a higher perceived level of well-being, lower infant mortality, better health, longer life expectancy, greater social mobility, and better learning results for children in school. There are fewer homicides and even fewer prisoners in jail. Let me again quote Professor Amartya Sen when he talks about functional capabilities in the society. The lack of functional capabilities opens up the whole poverty discourse to deal with much wider issues than just the scarcity of money. Education, health, cultural and social capital must be included in the bundle of capabilities needed for the full and free participation in societal activities. In the case of capabilities, deprivation, societal tensions always increase. Ladies and gentlemen, in today's world we don't need raw capitalism, not any sort of socialism, but responsible egalitarian market economy which the Nordic countries represent at their best. So the severe challenge for our societies in the 21st century is not only how we manage to create wealth, but also how we use it. But please, let's not be naive. Even the Nordic model cannot be taken for granted. At the same time, with the crisis of the whole European economy, we are facing big structural problems in the continent. Our egalitarian values and our societal model are at stake, and we have to take it very seriously. Our Nordic tradition of balancing the markets and growth with benefits to the society is entering a challenging phase. Are our struggling economy still able to bear the cost of our social model? When considering the answer, one should also ask whether our societies can bear the social cost of increasing poverty and inequality in the future. According to a recent study by Oxfam, the austerity programs implemented in Europe as a response to high public debt and budget deficits also have an impact for the recent increase in poverty and inequality. It is estimated by Eurostat that in 2011, 24% of the population in the EU risked poverty or social exclusion. That figure is estimated to rise by additional 15 to 25 million by 2025. We cannot afford such socio-economic development and creation of deeply unequal societies for our future generations. Increasing youth unemployment means for millions of young Europeans that they lack the resources needed to participate in the normal way of life of the surrounding society. The cost of such development override by far the investments in proactive employment policies. Ladies and gentlemen, another thing that I want to briefly touch upon is governance which again is closely related to the whole debate on fair society and quality of life. I have a privilege of being a member of the board of the Price Committee of Mo Ibrahim Foundation. The foundation has done a groundbreaking work in developing indicators for good governance. The Ibrahim Index of African Governance currently analyzes annually the performance of African countries and governments with 88 aspects of governance in four overreaching categories, safety and rule of law, participation and human rights, sustainable economic opportunity, and human development. The index indicates a close relation between good governance principles and egalitarian policies. 
But talking about Ibrahim Good Governance Index, I certainly don't want to claim that good governance is a challenge only for African or Asian countries. Quite contrary. I would like to use the same method methodology to assess also the performance of all countries of European Council <coughs> and its 47 member countries. I'm sure this would make a very interesting comparison. Egalitarian principles are also a pivotal tool on the field of conflict resolution and mediation or prevention, prevention if you may. If only only if one considers conflict resolution and mediation only as a distribution of political and economic powers, as many mistakenly take it, he or she will never succeed. All the political challenges that have to do with people's quality of life have to be taken into account when negotiating and implementing peace. Sustainable peace is not measured only by the absence of violence and violent structures but by opportunities and access to these opportunities available in the society. It is a task of any peace mediator to ensure that peace advances access to these opportunities. When talking about sustainable peace in any given society, equal access to opportunities is everything. Only this way we can build a society in which its citizens accept and respect their public institutions. If access to opportunities is not properly ensured, legitimacy pace of politics will always be erupted. Without proper education, health system, an adequate level of social security, functional capabilities of citizens will not be materialized. Dear friends, it is very clear for me that I shouldn't have had the, that if I shouldn't have had the access to various opportunities in this country in my past, I certainly wouldn't be standing here today. I'm a product of Nordic model, which is based on egalitarian principles. These principles are the ones we need to work for actively and strategically and defend them, because they are worth de defending. I thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. We are now joined by a panel of three distinguished specialists in development who have agreed to share today their perspectives on the issues and challenges addressed by President Artisaria and Professor Sen. May I introduce to you Elsie Kanser, at the helm of Africa, the World Economic Forum as director, formerly an economic advisor to the President of Tanzania, and who in 2011 was named one of Forbes' 20 power women in Africa. Welcome to you, Elsie. <laughs> Professor Martin Ravalian, who after a stunning career at the World Bank, most recently as director of the World Bank's research department, is now at Georgetown University. Welcome, Martin. and Professor Ravi Kanbur from Cornell University, and I'm happy to say member of the wider board, one of the most insightful development economists who has over the years been associated with wider. Ravi, thanks for being here. <coughs> Martin, you have more than anyone contributed to our understanding of poverty measurement and impact assessment. What implications does the equitable Nordic approach have in reducing global poverty, if any? I've often wondered about this, and I've often been a little bit um, disappointed that there wasn't more articulation, that's sounding better, of um, what a Nordic model means 
and what the implications are for developing countries. And um, I think it is a, a relevant alternative model, but I think it, it tends to be characterized by people who don't know much about it in rather simplistic terms. I don't pretend to know a lot either. Uh, I've studied um, uh, policy in poor countries for all my working, almost, almost all my working life, but, uh, and correct me if I say anything uh, questionable about the Nordic model. I, I don't think it's about um, um, fiscal redistribution. I don't think it's about using the tools of, of taxation and spending to redistribute from rich people to poor people in, in, a, in a straightforward way. Um, nor do I think it's, it's certainly that's been part of the, the, of the Nordic model, but nor do I think it's crucially about uh, the capability of, of states uh, locally and centrally. I think that's part of the model too, but those two features are shared by many other models and some very prominent ones. If I think about it, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'd say it was very much about the concept of equity, the egalitarian principle. Um, and I think in, an, in the Nordic model, I would contend that it's very much around um, not so much inequality of opportunity, but assuring re reduction in the poverty of opportunity. The fact that opportunities are, are low or <laughs> terrible. For, for many poor people, for focusing the opportunity egalitarianism toward the opportunities, lack of opportunities, of the poorest people in society, and using the tools of fiscal redistribution to expand those opportunities in a way that they can, have a, can achieve a broad social consensus. I think that's been crucial. How relevant is that to the countries that I work in, um, more, more than any other in, in India and, and China, um, but others too? Um, I think there are a couple of points I, I'd make on, on the relevance. Um, people sometimes say that you know, this, this stuff of inequality opportunity is just something for rich countries. It's a concept coming out of the rich world and it's not really relevant to developing countries. I would question that. And first thing I'd point out is the very idea of a quality of opportunity came from rich countries, but when they were poor countries. It emerged toward the end of the Age of Enlightenment and the latter part of the 18th century and, uh, in countries which were, or would be considered poor if they were uh, to the, by today's standards. Um, it didn't, it isn't, isn't just a concept for rich countries, it's a concept that emerged in developing countries but the developing countries which became the rich countries of today. I'd also argue it's a concept that's relevant to the uh, many, of, as, as uh, Finn mentioned, I worked for the World Bank for a, a long time. It would be no surprise that, not because I worked for the World Bank, that I think economic growth is, is hugely important to expanding opportunities. It's not an end, it's a means, but it's something that's very important to achieving those, those ends. Uh, but equally well, I'd say expanding opportunities of poor people is crucial to achieving that growth. If you can get in a virtuous cycle of expanding opportunities, promoting economic growth, because it's often poor people who are locked out of the opportunities for economic expansion. And the more people you have, the, the less economic expansion you're going to have in the aggregate. Uh, and that's a, a crucial point. I think it's also important for peace, for the st sustainability of peace, both in the ability of, uh, of, of, expand, of opportunity egalitarianism to promote economic opportunity, but also to make the, the peace sustainable. Uh, and that's obviously crucial. The forms of public action, well, as I've said, I think the importance of making sure that the opportunity expansion is, is, is for those who lack opportunities. The point of opportunity egalitarianism, if you like, is not to reduce the opportunities of those who have ample opportunity. But of course, you're going to need fiscal redistribution. You're going to need to tax. And you're going to need to tax uh, rich people to finance the interventions you need to expand the, the opportunities of poor people to assure that they can participate in in economic expansion going forward. Um, also issues, I think, importantly of legal justice and democratic reforms. Um, when you, I'm impressed that, so I've re recently written a history of thought on, on anti-poverty policy and I was struck, which was, I wrote from my uh, PhD students in economics at Georgetown who, like me, uh, even more than me, didn't that know much about the history of thought. Economists are not taught this anymore. But I was really struck by, by how much political struggle there was to achieve. The things that we now take for granted in rich countries uh, have been achieved in some 
developing countries. And what, is, and what struggle was involved? I mean, the, the, the ability of people to organize, the ability of the labor movement that's has contributed enormously uh, to that progress in basic things like suffrage, which we take for granted now. Um, issues in debate, and I think there are still a few, just a couple of points. I don't think um, opportunity egalitarianism will ever be a sufficient principle for equity. It's, it's not enough, and the reason is that opportunity egalitarianism essentially says that you know, if, if, if it's all to do with your individual effort, then the inequality is okay. Now, the, you know, we can accept that as a principle, and I think it could have a lot of currency, but, but people make mistakes. All kinds of things happen, that, that, can't, that, that efforts that end up in, in deprivations that we will want policy to address. Um, another argue, issue is the scope for individual responsibility. Individual responsibility is, is evident in everything to do with the, the philosophical discussions and the economic discussions of opportunity egalitarianism. Um, but it's a slippery slope there. Behaviour intervenes all the time between circumstances and outcomes in society. And there are all kinds of, of ways in which uh, the opportunity egalitarianism can, can care, somewhat carelessly slip into either blaming poor people for their poverty or excusing rich people for their, their, rich, their riches on the grounds of some effort they made to, to achieve those, those riches. And, and, and that, can, that, can be, that can be entirely legitimate or it cannot be, but it becomes very fuzzy. So I think there's a, there's a lot of work to do, actually, in adapting if possible, the Nordic model to developing countries. And uh, I think we've seen progress along that in, in that work, but I think uh, there's a lot more to do. Ravi, you work mainly in non-Nordic settings, although you are a welcome visitor to Finland regularly, but you work mainly in Africa, Asia. What is your perspective on the Artisari vision? Is the Nordic experience relevant for developing countries? Yeah. What's your perspective? Good, well, uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Finn. Let me first of all say thank you to President Artisari for uh, uh, not only for the uh, for the speech, but also the the detailed paper, uh, which we have. It's going to be released next week, I believe. Uh, this one, yeah, uh, and that has a lot lot of detail. And actually, my comments are addressed somewhat to uh, to the to the more detailed paper as well. Uh, so uh, Finn's question is: Is the is the Nordic model or is the Nordic experience relative for social policy in low-income countries? And my answer is yes and no. <laughs> Uh, so let me, uh, let me say, first of all, uh, in what sense it isn't uh, directly relevant, uh, and then say in what sense it is. And I think both, both the elements of this are actually present in President Atisari's longer, longer paper. So, I mean, I draw on the longer paper for, for making these, these comments. So the sense in which it's not relevant is if we take the current situation, if we take the current mechanisms, take the current implementation, and try to translate that automatically into a low-income setting. Uh, and all of us may say, yeah, that's obviously wrong, but I assure you there's a tendency to do that. There's a tendency to slip into that frame. And I think there are two aspects of the current, of the realities of low-income countries contrasted with the Nordic setting, which of course was di is discussed by President Adyasari in, his, in the longer paper. Firstly, it's the heterogeneity in these countries relative to the relative homogeneity in Nordic settings. And secondly, the state capacity that's available in low-income countries versus the state capacity that's available in the, in the Nordic context. And I think we have to be extremely cautious uh, in making simple translations and say, well, let's have this particular social security system or that particular thing, etc., just because it's, it's working now in the, Nordic, in the Nordic system. I think that, that's an obvious point, and it's made, it's made in President Atisari's uh, paper, uh, but I think it's, it's as well for us to, to bear that in mind, because believe you me, we do slip into that in, uh, in policy contexts, uh, particularly when we're dealing with governments of low-income countries. Let me say the sense in which it is relevant What's relevant to me, and again this comes out in the President's paper, uh, is the history of how Nordic countries got from where they were to where they are. Okay? Because as, as he makes clear in the paper, it wasn't so long ago, less than 100 years ago, that actually these countries had low state capacity and were heterogeneous in highly uh, politically salient uh, senses. Uh, as, as I said in the paper, I mean, uh, people outside of Finland don't, don't realize that when you say white or red in Finland, that means 
that signifies something uh, dramatic, quite dramatic in terms of the Civil War, and families trace their origins back to this, and that, 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 that those cleavages in Finnish society uh, from the Civil War were overcome. Uh, and I think, in a sense, more relevant to, our, to, to, to low-income countries is how were they overcome? What was the process? What were the two steps forward, one step back of that process? And in his paper, President Atasari touches on that and the role of the education system and so on. But I think I would, have, I would like to see more work done on that. And frankly, that I think would be highly relevant to, uh, to low-income countries, to those people like me who, who, who advise low-income countries, etc. What were the mechanisms 100 years ago, 70 years ago, even 50 years ago, after the, after the Second World War, when the great displacements of population took place in Finland, what was the detail of that, of that process? So I think that's, that, to me, is where, yes, it is, it is highly relevant. It's the history that's highly relevant. And the second is, of course, again, state capacity, because, again, as is pointed out in the paper, 100 years ago, there wasn't the state capacity, but it was actually purposively uh, developed. And what's interesting is how there was, there was a sort of an, an ecology developed where the state capacity, where, where the need for social policy led to development of state capacity, and then that then fed back into social policy, etc. We know this in a very general sense, but what we have here is a real live laboratory of how it happened. And I, for one, don't know enough about that and, and the lessons of that, uh, of, that, uh, of that experience. So those are really my, my observations. Is the Nordic experience relevant for so social policy in low-income countries? I would say be very cautious be very cautious, and uh, uh, particularly in the aid context, particularly in the context when there's Nordic money on the table, uh, not to make simple translations uh, from this to that. But on the other hand, as made very clear in the paper, uh, it's the history that's important. Uh, and there, there are indeed very deep lessons to be learned, but we need much more work to be done on that in order for the lessons to be, to be drawn out and then translated across. Thank you. Uh. Elsie? As a development practitioner and advisor, you have a primary interest in lessons that may be relevant for Africa. How does what we've heard today contribute? Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Finn. By and large, I will echo um, what has been said so far um, and also underscore some of the, the differences that I think are critical to the applicability of the, of the Nordic model um, in Africa. First of all, it's just the, the size of the continent. You talk about 54, 55 countries, uh, depending on how you count it. And um, while on the, on the face of it, uh, I myself, as well as many others, do agree with President Atisari that we need to look beyond growth in terms of measuring GDP and move towards improving um, the lives of people. And this issue has become much more urgent uh, and critical at the moment because of the uh, of the, uh, the crisis that took place in, in North Africa, which brought to the forefront that it's not enough to do well in terms of GDP. It's not enough for you to have a well-qualified uh, labor force. They have to have something to do or else they will take the government uh, to account and also then push this element of the role of the state. And uh, one of the key outcomes that we're seeing, um, one from that, but then also from the industrial actions that have to, some, to, to a large extent paralyzed the mining sector in South Africa is the state is also uh, perceived as, as a threat rather than as a, as a, as a form of support, uh, looking out for the interests of the people. And therefore, um, there's an increased interest in broadening the stakeholder group um, that is vested with the responsibility, one, of actually delivering on growth, but then two, on also um, improving on people's lives, also by in involving the people themselves. Um, just looking at the continent and the diversity there within about seven um, of the fastest growing countries around the world are in sub-Saharan Africa. There's a mixed group, uh, less than a third are actually growing on the basis of natural resources, although many of us think that it's the resource-rich countries um, that are driving uh, the growth, uh, but that's not true. We have countries like Ethiopia that are growing on the basis of being able to transform their agriculture. We also have, um, amongst the resource-rich, you know, so-called fragile states like Sierra Leone and you know, the DRC, um, which further complicates the picture uh, because it introduces um, a lot more, I'd say, threats with respect to, uh, to the strength of the states and the institutions because the institutional frameworks are quite weak. 
and in and of itself uh, leads us to question sustainability of a natural resource management in those particular countries. That notwithstanding, we've seen improvements in terms of social indicators um, across Africa. Access to health and education has increased. Um, the elimination of extreme poverty has increased. You've seen the number of um, Africans living at less than a uh, dollar point two five per day, dropping from about uh, 58 to 48 percent, and school enrollment is now up by about. Um, 80 percent. Even with respect to bridging inequality, uh, just uh, with respect to closing the gender gap, um, our report, the Global Gender Gap Report from 2012, showed that Sub-Saharan Africa has, uh, inc has managed to close the gap by about 66 percent. And uh, back to the point about diversity, the top performer is Lesotho. Um, in general, though, Africa continues to perform really poorly with respect to the education um, sub-index, and this is where you have the largest uh, gender gap. So, with respect to where um, we see some limitations, and, and this really I raise as a, as a question as to how to bridge the gap, is that Africa is starting from a very low base. So, uh, huge infrastructure deficits, um, food insecurity is still a major challenge which is compounded uh, by the uh, global challenge of, of addressing climate change. Um, but then you also have challenges that uh, arise from the, from the continent itself. So, for example, the intra-Africa trade is just about 12% compared to about 40% in Asia and 60% in the European Union. Um, again, with respect to, uh, to inequality as well, you know, there's challenges that are also spatial, moving beyond just income inequality or gender inequality. Um, and increasingly, you have inequalities that are along the lines uh, of you know, religious backgrounds or um, ethnicity, which further complicates the policy measures that can be taken to address them. Um, the most important point, though, is it seems that the patterns of economic growth that have been pursued um, to date seems to be entrenching and worsening the inequalities, and there's an increased interest in finding new ways and new growth models um, that can actively reduce the um, the inequality. Some of the things um, that we've seen happening is increased collaboration, for example, around agriculture, recognizing that quite a few people, quite a few of the poorest, uh, or the majority of the poorest people are involved in the agricultural sector. So how can the different stakeholders work together and find a way of pursuing agricultural transformation um, interventions that actually bring along smallholder farmers as opposed to pursuing um, interventions that assume that smallholder farmers will, will come along. The jury's still out on, on how far that will go. It's, it doesn't help that urbanization is picking up quite rapidly. About 40% of Africans now live in cities, and this is actually higher than the rate for India. Um, and the last point I wanted to make is that what's also compounding the problem is youth unemployment. The estimates are that by 2015, Africa will be the youngest continent in the world, and by 2040, Africa will have a labor force that equals China. Now, if you look at the gaps with respect to infrastructure, with respect to education, um, it's quite a worrying picture as to how uh, the governments, but then also business civil society can organize themselves. Um, to be able to, uh, one, ensure that you can sustain the, the growth path, which is necessary, but two, ensure that people's lives are transformed, um, and in this respect, the majority of people, because some people already live a very uh, luxurious lifestyles, first world lifestyles, but that the majority of people actually feel that they have been carried along by this uh, wave of progress. Thanks, Martin. In 1990, more than 90% of the world's poor lived in low-income countries. This has changed. Today, some 75% of the world's poor are in middle-income countries. Um, President Adesari has made the point that the situation of the worst off in a society is a powerful indicator of how successful the entire society is. So I'm sort of wondering, I mean, does that mean that development over the past 25 years have not really lived up to expectations? Again, I think we have a microphone on problem. Um, microphone off problem. We've um, made enormous progress against poverty. Uh, the fact that 90% uh, or some percentage, I'm not sure there's 90, live in middle income countries, and that's a rather fictional category. I, I, I really can't attach any meaning to that concept almost. But um, 
that fact does not mean we've been unsuccessful against poverty. It, it, they, those countries just mean some, the poor are still roughly where they were before, it's just that those countries have been successful against poverty and uh, hence their poverty is now concentrated in, in that category of countries. Um, looking forward uh, and the acceleration we're seeing in poverty reduction, extreme absolute poverty reduction in the developing world is remarkable uh, and it's not just China. Uh, I think if you're looking at the period since 2000, um, well, we've not seen anything like it before. I emphasize it's about extreme absolute poverty, literally or living below $1.25 a day, or meaning living below the standards of what poverty means in, in the poorest countries in the world. If you use higher standards, the progress is not nearly as impressive. But you know, if you're looking at extreme poverty, the progress is undeniable. Um, and in fact, if that trajectory since 2000, if that continues, we will get down to a poverty rate, an extreme poverty rate of 3% by 2030. And I have a paper documenting how we, how we could do that. So I'm actually very optimistic on, on that dimension of poverty. I think there's a lot of work to do um, in, in non-income dimensions of poverty, which, progress with, which will be crucial and synergistic with income poverty reduction. Uh, and there's also a lot of work to do in, in, in poverty by the, in addressing poverty by the standards of the country you live in. We're talking about $1.25 a day. We're talking about an absolute standard across all countries. And I think we have to think of two measures, if you like, in any country. That absolute standard and the, the standard of what poverty means in that country. By the, or the standards that are typical of a country at that level of living. Both an absolute and a relative concept are going to be relevant going forward. Um, I can talk further about this, sure. but I no, think it's time that, to shut That up. makes a lot of sense to me. Ravi, you wish to add anything? Uh, and, and I'm sort of wondering, do you have any reactions to the way in which President Adesari and, and, and sort of discussed India and China? Okay. Let me, uh, so I, I won't talk about the, in the India-China comparison because, you know, we, can, we could be here <laughs> all night on that thing. There are books written about it and uh, whole sort of articles and so on. And I think President Adesari basically touched on uh, touched on the fundamental issues uh, involved when he said, let's be frank, there's something in here that we're not used to, the way we're not used to thinking. I think that's exactly right. But let me, let me take up the next comparison that he came to and mm -hmm. link it back to my state capacity issue, okay. which is the Bangladesh uh, comparison. In the literature, there's something called the Bangladesh paradox. And the paradox is not actually that Bangladesh, uh, uh, the, the label paradox is given not to the fact that Bangladesh has half of India's per capita GNP and yet has these good social indicators. The paradox is that Bangladesh, on governance indicators, comes out to be much worse than all these other countries. <laughs> comes out to be at the bottom of the world le uh, league in terms of Transparency International, et cetera, et cetera. And yet it has these fantastic uh, social indicators, okay? Uh, relative to its own performance 15 years ago, relative to India's performance, relative to whatever neighborhood, everything else. So <laughs> that, that to me, friends, let's face this fact, okay? What's going on over here? Well, one response to that is, yeah, you know, actually these, these, these international governance indicators are right. Sta the state essentially has collapsed, it's totally corrupt, it's whatever it is. But you know, it's, it's all these, it's the, it's the NGOs. It's, it's, uh, it's Grameen Bank, it's Mohammed Yunus. Uh, that's, what's, that's what's really doing all this sort of stuff. And I think that's too easy an answer. That's clearly a contribution. I think that's too easy an answer. And it actually takes us away from what exactly is state capacity and whether state capacity is actually being measured accurately by our international measures uh, of mm -hmm. governance and transparency internationally. Because the way that I put it to, to, my, uh, uh, to my students is somebody has to build the road <laughs> on which Muhammad Yunus rides his bicycle to the village uh, to do the uh, uh, microcredit scheme. Somebody has to maintain the regulatory framework within which a micro-banking system operates. And at the, very at the very least, or at the very worst, the government could have stepped in there and ruined it for Eunice. Hmm? But they didn't. We have to understand the political economy <laughs> of how it was that the state, which could have messed things up, and indeed, according to these Transparency International things, seems to have messed it up, but didn't. It stayed back. Okay? So I think that leads us to a whole interesting set of discussions about the nature of state capacity when the country with the worst governance indicators has, the, has these excellent social indicator performance, social indicators, and you cannot put it all down to, uh, to Grameen Bank and Proshika and BRAC uh, and, and, uh, and so on. 
there was something after the War of Independence in Bangladesh, something in the polity, political economy, which led to, as the president mentioned, the empowerment of women, etc. And that's, that's the route that we should be going, and how exactly the state facilitated that, at the, very, at, at the very minimal, by actually not getting in the way, but also by positively supporting it. Thanks. Elsie, I know that you have quite some views on Adesari's discussions and reflection around productivity and competitiveness. I guess it's fair to say that Africa needs to compete. You have any thoughts? Uh, yes, and, and this time I'll be much shorter. Um, one, it's, it's quite fascinating that uh, Finland in particular has managed to sustain its ranking as the third most uh, productive and competitive uh, country in the world, according to the Global uh, Competitiveness Index. And Sweden is also in the top 10. And then you have Norway and Denmark, you know, at 11 and, and 15 or 16. Um, and in contrast, uh, the top ranked African country is Mauritius at 45. And um, th the assessment of the different indicators is that uh, part of the uh, success with respect to Finland, as well as uh, most of the other Nordic countries, is you know, having very healthy macroeconomic environments, which uh, can be said to be true in terms of the reforms that are taking place uh, amongst many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, but also very strong public institutions, very transparent institutions, and that is a major challenge for Africa. Then also the foundation of education, um, very high quality of education at, at all levels. Um, and the key question that I have here is, uh, one, to what extent um, countries in Africa can replicate this given the resources that uh, countries like Finland you know, put into the system to, for instance, ensure that everyone has access to education uh, for free and it's very high quality uh, level of education globally. I mean, it's very well recognized. And how sustainable is that um, for most countries where most of the, you know, most of the of the labor force is not paying taxes, is involved in the informal economy. Um, this to some extent seems like a, a nice idea, something that's nice to have, but not really realistic. Um, linked to that is also the size, right? So the size of Finland is roughly about the size of Dar es Salaam. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and is there, is there something to be said for uh, putting in place these systems and making things work in a smaller economy versus uh, the larger diverse economies um, that um, that we in Africa have to contend with. Um, and finally, it's just the trust element that is also quite central uh, to the value uh, of the Finns, but also across the other Nordic countries. Um, and to be honest, just the challenges that uh, the people feel in, in Africa, as is true for much of the emerging world, that you know, corruption's too entrenched, people care too much about themselves or their people vis-a-vis um, -vis the broader population. And um, again, you know, to what extent can we actually export uh, this brand, is it exportable? Are you also seeing challenges that are emerging from uh, you know, increased immigration, opening up to values from other places? You know, perhaps there's, there's something in this, perhaps there's none. It may be a non-issue, uh, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. President Arsar, you want to briefly reflect on these uh, remarks? <coughs> we discussed before we <laughs> came, came here whether I should say anything. Or <laughs> but I, I can't sit here quiet when my old friends are, like you, are challenging me. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> I owe it to you <laughs> from our past. First of all, when, when we talk about resources, uh, first of all, I, I, I made a long list of things what one can do in any society. First of all, how do you use your resources? How much you have is another issue, but how do you use whatever you have? On education, I would clearly give preference to uh, girls in education. If you have a scarcity of funds, give girls a uh, privilege. Uh, <coughs> You remember that Newsweek chose Finland as the best place to live. When, when I heard that from my wife, I said to her, how lousy are the others? <laughs> <laughs> I was on the phone and far away, so she didn't, she didn't get, get on me. But the point I wanted to tell her that if we start believing that we are living in a paradise already, 
everything is relative, that we are relatively better than others. All the comparisons tell, tell about that, but we are not living in paradise. And when it comes to uh, gender equality, we are supposed to be again on the top of the list, but there's enormous amount of work that still needs to be done in this society. I say it everywhere where I speak, that the women have to be much, much better than we men in order to get the same treatment in a society. There's no question about that, and I, I, I hope that none of the Finnish men here are, are, are denying what I'm, I'm, I'm saying. Uh, then, decent education, <coughs> when you start from that, so that the teachers are in the school and they don't only appear once or twice a week there and to collect their salaries. Rule of law. If, if you want to have a society, you have to have a proper functioning rule of law. And, and it costs less to have a properly functioning rule of law than non functioning rule of law, as we both know. Transparency in, in, in what the governments do and how, how the official resources are, are used. And uh, totally negative attitude towards corruption, because we know that corruption is, is pestering. All societies, some less than others, but, but it's, it's rampant in many, many places. Um, can I answer another question at sure. the same time? Sure. Because uh, uh, Ravi Gamber was uh, talking about uh, how we succeeded in coming out of the civil war in this society in the, in the beginning of our, our I independence. I spoke last week in, in Bangkok. Thai government is trying to start a reconciliation process, which is not an easy. I was there with a number of speakers, and I was supposed to talk about my own experience, but I, I decided to start from Finland, because I think it's only fair to say that even this society has gone through, as you rightly say, that there would perhaps be something to learn. Perhaps the major thing I would like to say is that this was a very clear-cut fight. We had whites and reds describing the political sides. Of the whites won. But those who lost were given a political chance to participate in elections, which followed one year after these events. And then 10 years later, they, come to they gained the, the majority in, in the parliament, the, those who lost. After the war, during the war, everyone was united, but whatever you, you did during the civil war. And thereafter, everyone had a chance to, to participate in the political process on the basis of what support they had in a society. I think this inclusion is perhaps the message I would give even in speaking when I, I go again to, to Thailand and discuss with the parties there. So. These are the perhaps the simple messages that, that one can actually give to, to, to everybody. Thank you. And now we'll open up for some questions from the floor. May I remind everyone to introduce yourself and please, please do stick, uh, at least reasonably, to today's topic. Also, in the interest of wide participation, could you please state your questions or make your comment in a concise manner? You will have already noticed that time is slipping. Um, we have a tradition in WIDA of microphones that suddenly go off. So watch out. They may go off. So be, be precise, please. We will take questions one by one, and then uh, we will have some reactions. Who wants to start? OK. Here, up here. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tony Addison from the Wider Institute. Uh, Mr. President, um, Nordic political leaders seem to have had a, a very great ability to steer their societies through the turbulence of globalization, big geopolitical events, uh, many, many different and challenging 
situations and create a consensus about change and adaption. When, when you talk to leaders in Africa and elsewhere in the developing world, what do you advise about leadership in the kind of world that we have today with its many challenges and its many uncertainties? Mr. President? First, first of all, I, I don't think that I travel anymore that much in different parts of the world than I used to. I still travel 100 and 150 days, but slightly less trying to advise uh, governments on, on what they should be doing, except in, in this example from, from Thailand. Uh, I think, first of all, it is important that everywhere we recognize what is the reality. You can't hide the facts of life. And you have to try to reach a common understanding. I remember when I became president in, in the beginning of 94, we had, our unemployment rate was around 18 percent. And we had 450,000 people were unemployed. And I had talked about improving the employment possibilities, though it was not regarded as a presidential function. I, I was approached by the Secretary General of the Central Labor Union and the leading capitalist in this country at the time, and a mediator who had, who had worked for Finnish industry. And they said that we are prepared to work with you if you want to improve the situation. We managed to have, I give this as an example, we managed to have individuals coming to this working group who didn't represent their organizations but themselves. They came with the recommendations which our aim was to improve in six years, which was my term as a president, to cut it down to 200,000, the figure of unemployed. We succeeded in getting it down to 250,000 because government paid the official debt faster than we had anticipated, which was fair enough. But that shows, I think, something in this society of ours that we have a capacity which I hope that we can transfer and tell about much more, that when things are difficult, we sit down and we find a way how we can work together and, and improve the sit situation dramatically, which we did in the 90s. I was criticized that I was interfering with something that I had nothing to do I traveled with the Finnish industry to every place they wanted in export promotion fashion, except South Korea, which had economic difficulties, and we agreed that there we shouldn't go. Well over 20 trips with industry, wherever they wanted to promote me to help them to promote Finnish exports, and it worked. So you have to uh, recognize the facts, and I think in our society that has been we have had economists meeting from employers and employees under the Ministry of Finance, and there's not no great disagreement how the economic outlook looks like. So it's possible to start the salary negotiations on the basis of those facts. I have always admired that capacity in this society, and that you can tell your own story. And, and if the end result is good, I hope somebody listens. But I have no illusion how difficult it is. Okay. There was a gentleman in the very back. No, you use the mic, please. Uh, there are people who listen outside. Also. Okay. My name is Markus Manfors, and I am from Helsinki School of Economics. And my question is to the all panel, at least for President Ahtisaari. Uh, what do you think, which one is the best model, social model, Finnish model, Russian model, US model, Chinese model, or, or something else, and why? 
Okay. Mr. President, which model is the best? I honestly don't know. Are you student or teacher in the... <laughs> <laughs> you are student? Yes, but course assistant. Course assistant. Yes. I, yeah. My God. <laughs> <laughs> because I hope you listened what I said. Why, why I argue that it's worthwhile for us to produce this paper with the help of two scholars from Finland, two from Sweden, and one from Denmark. Those, they are the authors of that paper, and I have not influenced their, their work at all. Uh, because I feel that inequality, I have lived in the United States for long enough, and I have always been arguing for transatlantic cooperation, uh, and in, in favor of that, that's well known. And I know that if, if I want to solve any problem, if I can't have the Americans supporting me what I intend to do, there's very little chances of getting anything done. And that I learned from my first enterprise with when I was dealing with uh, Namibia and every other conflict thereafter that I was involved. But there's no question that I don't think that, and you don't necessarily need to read Jeffrey Jack's book, Price of Civilization, or Joseph Stiglitz's Price of Inequality, or Henrik Smith's book, Who Has Stolen the American Dream, to see that at the moment the American dream is not there. Inequality has increased to the extent that it's, it's a bit scary. So my answer is very clear. I hope that at least if we are organized in the Nordic countries, we should be better organized to offer our view on how we have achieved over the decades to come where we are at the moment, and how this society ha functions now, how it needs to be adjusted, because it's not a sort of stable situation. But I, I, I don't hesitate in saying that I don't know any better model for, for ordinary citizens in a society. Then, and and it's, it's so that there's another book, uh, the, uh, the Spirit Level, Richard uh, Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, with, sub, with the subtitle, Equality is Good for Everybody in a Society. And it's worthwhile to look at that book recommend that to your, your group. <laughs> <laughs> All four are worth reading. Okay. Th there was a lady uh, in row three from the, uh, from the back. Okay, no indication. Okay, uh, there's a gentleman here from Africa, uh, just in front of the just speaking. Ha, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Abdul Gafaru Abdullahi, um, and I come from Ghana. Um, and my question goes to um, Martin. Um, I, I very much uh, um, in your arguments that expanding opportunities to those excluded uh, is important to, um, both to stimulate national economic growth and for sustainable peace and development. But as someone coming from the World Bank, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about the central message of the World Development Report 2009 that because economic growth is inevitably unbalanced, I mean, partly because some places are more naturally endowed than others, developing country, I mean, uh, developing country governments should focus on moving um, the poor from lagging areas to more productive sectors or productive parts of, the, of a country rather than I mean, striving to move productive investments to, to poorer regions. What is the potential of such um, an argument in terms of stimulating more inclusive forms of development, given what we know? about the deplorable state in which most migrants across the world often do find themselves. Okay, Martin, you want to react? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, I'm no longer at the World Bank, which also means I can criticize yeah, openly, <laughs> not that I was constrained before. Um, one thing is I, I'm really not a big fan of world development reports. Um, 
I mean, the gentleman to my left did one of the, the best. Um, he, 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 dumped <laughs> yeah, it. He, he dumped it before he, it was finished, so <laughs> yes. it wasn't quite as good as it could have been. But um, that World Development Report, you've signalled you signaled out the one that I would probably raise the most objections to <laughs> of all the World Development Reports. But, but I would say that um, there are important constraints on the mobility of people, and those constraints hit poor people more than others. And to the extent that public action is directed at, at eliminating those constraints, um, when they're costless, or, or at least making an effort to eliminating, eliminating them when they're not as, a pr as appropriate, I'd say that was a, was a good thing. Um, you know, one of the biggest constraints on mobility in the world today is in China, the hukou system of registration, which uh, is a, a huge cost to poor people in China. Uh, combined with the fact that they can't buy and sell agricultural land freely. Um, the two, those two features uh, mean that poor people are, are taxed in the sense they can't turn their main asset, and the poor people, predominantly rural, can't turn their main asset, can't monetize their main asset and easily move to the cities. And they can't easily move to the cities because they can't bring their, their children and their families because of the registration system. Uh, it, it's essentially an internal passport system within China. I think you know, reforming that system, um, basically eliminating it, which I, as the Central Communist Party has been trying to do for a long time, but without success, um, is one of the most important agendas for mobility and poverty reduction in the world today. Uh, hugely important. So there's an example that's consistent with that. But the idea of generalizing, I think that report just generalized the, I the idea too far uh, and built it on a, a rather simplistic, in my view, rather simplistic economic model. Okay, there was a gentleman over here. Yeah, here, uh, a little bit back. Yeah, go back, go back, go back. Here, yeah. Thank you so much for a wonderful panel. It's a question for, uh, for Mr. Uh, President. Um, uh, perhaps you can say a little bit about the... Um, uh, I am from the Netherlands, and one of the things that struck me in the Netherlands in the last 10 years, this was also, there's still a country that is, is marked by, by, by strong egalitarian principles and has turned uh, distinctly anti-immigrant. Anti uh, my uh, superficial study of, of, of what happened in, in Europe suggests that, that Denmark was very much ahead in, and I'm not talking about day-to-day -day racism, which, which is not, not unique, but, but certainly in, in, in the way in which the state has marginalized or created a feeling of marginalization among immigrant uh, people. And I just was wondering if you could comment on that side of the, uh, of the, the Nordic model where, where the homogeneity is very important for the egalitarian principles and the constraints, the possible constraints or the possibilities to overcome the constraints vis-a-vis -vis immigrants. And my name is Arjan Lahan, by the way, from, uh, from IDRC. Okay. Mr. President? I, I could have actually said that when, when I talk about Nordic model, in all fairness, I should have mentioned that Netherlands and Germany to some ex to very large extent are following similar principles in, in these two societies. Uh, now, it's traditionally argued, and, and that issue is, is tackled also in, in, in the paper, so I give you the name so that you can look next week our website and hopefully get it from there. It's a recipe for better life experiences from the Nordic countries. This is the title of, of the report. But the fact of life is that if you would compare uh, Sweden and UK, it was a surprise to me, but, but what the authors <laughs> proved was that there are more foreign-born people in, in Sweden compared to the original uh, population in Sweden than in UK. And that was not what I had expected. So the structure of the society changes, and, and, and I think it's a major challenge for all the countries, and it has clearly political consequences. Look at the, uh, I can't help thinking that uh, the recent elections in, in Norway, for instance, had something to do with the immigration policies. So it's, it's a major challenge because on the other hand, <laughs> it's very clear that for the whole of Europe, with the aging population, if we don't have 
uh, people coming from outside Europe to work in, in our, our economy and society, uh, I think we, we are lost. I mean, that's what I mean, that we have to recognize the facts of life and, and actually encourage the proper immigration processes and, and proper training for those who, who come so that they can be integrated properly and, and they have a prosperous life. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, here. I, yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm Stephen from the University of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And I have a question that goes to both Mr. President and the uh, Ravalio Martin. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, in your talk, you mentioned that uh, economic growth is no longer a remedy to poverty alleviation. And what is important is the, how the generated revenue from economic growth is used. But when Martin was making his contribution, he emphasized that economic growth is important and it's really, it's, it's important. So do you guys really want now to reconcile these two? Thank you. <laughs> So, the peacemaker. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, it's, you know that I, I have very, I, I, I have a love affair with Tanzania because I was young ambassador of 34 years of age when I, I came to Tanzania in 1973. And I have dear friends from, from that time uh, still. I don't think we have any argument. <laughs> because if you don't have economic growth, you have nothing to distribute. <laughs> How can you uh, offer your citizens a decent education if you don't have revenues? So economic growth is absolutely vital, and I, I don't think we can make a... Uh, uh, you can't argue that we have a different view. My point was simply that it is important that we have paid so much attention, for instance, in this world, and I have been in a global commission on, on improving the elections and so on. We are having better and better elections in the world, but we have very little observation still globally. What do those who are elected, perhaps in good and decent, fair elections, how are they using the power when they come to the office? And we need to do that as well. Are they running egalitarian policies or are they running policies that are mainly enriching themselves and their relatives? Which we have enough examples in the world today. And we don't need to go to Africa for that. Okay, Martin, you want to say um, anything? Very, briefly? very quickly, maybe the empirical stylized facts need a little bit of um, rehearsing or repetition. Um, economic growth has typically typically, I emphasize, come with absolute poverty reduction in developing countries. And that's an, that's an empirical observation. The channels are, are, are not straightforward, and um, President Atazari has mentioned an important one, which is the scope that that creates for supporting pro-poor interventions in other forms. I, I think in the poorest countries, that hasn't been the main mechanism. I think the main mechanism has just been through the process of creating jobs and creating economic opportunities in those countries. Uh, but I, I emphasize the typical. There are exceptions to that, that stylized fact, that holds as a stylized fact. Um, but another second observation from the evidence is that the impact of a given rate of growth on poverty reduction varies enormously. Uh, it's typically poverty reducing, but you can talk about the same rate of growth can give, give, give you anything from a modest impact on poverty to a huge impact on poverty. And what, what determines what, which it is? The biggest thing is inequality. Simple economic inequality determines whether economic growth is going to be massively poverty reducing. Obviously, the more inequality you have in the society, the less the poor are able to participate in the benefit of economic growth and the less poverty reduction you get from that economic growth. Thirdly, I'd emphasize that there's an important feedback mechanism, which I, I, I talked about before, and which is much more central to the discussion today, but which is that poverty itself, the right sort of poverty reduction, is important. Um, it's not 
probably necessary and it's probably not sufficient, but it's important to economic growth and the sustainability of poverty reduction in going forward. Okay, one last question from the floor. And then I will ask the panel if they have any uh, final comments before I give the last word to President Ad Sorry. Uh, Andrea Cornia, University of Florence, formerly WIDE. Uh, I think that from uh, what I know is, I mean, uh, all the theory of collective action tells us that uh, societies which are more homogeneous and they share the same objectives and so on and so forth, they perform better. And, uh, and the paper which I quickly read, uh, the one which is coming out next week, I already read it, and the president was kind enough to give it to me half an hour ago. So, uh, raises one of the, tries to basically to deny the fact that these are homogeneous societies and they are egalitarian because they are homogeneous. So, uh, so it looks like that uh, this egalitarianism is a, a fact of the will. So it's a moral fact. That, that does not really fit with uh, what economic theory tells us. And at the same time, I think that uh, there are some factors which would be interesting to point out. For instance, in Finland and in Costa Rica, there has never been high land concentration. Finland, uh, in Finland, the landlords were the Swedes. When the Swedes left, well, the that, uh, that this, this social class disappeared. Costa Rica, when the Spaniards, they landed uh, in Costa Rica, the Indians, they escaped on the hills. And the Costa Rica is a very low land concentration and is the country with the highest equity in, in the region. In the Sahel, there are countries which uh, also at a much lower level of income, they are much more cohesive. So perhaps it would be important uh, in promoting uh, this uh, ideal, which I fully share, also which are th those which we may call endogenous factors or whatever you want, that uh, basically make uh, universalism and egalitarianism feasible. And, and the second point is that, uh, I mean, I saw watch that... Out, watch out, the mic might go out. Yeah, uh, very quick, very quick one. I mean, because it's mentioned in the note of the president. I mean, uh, Sweden has been ranked like number one as a country, but at the same time, we see that there are there are revolts in the peripheries and so on and so forth. And the, the note of the president says we have to invest more in integration. Now, the countries who have been, I mean, they have a long enough history of social integration is basically the U.S. There, there, there are no other countries with 200 years of uh, an history of migration. So it's not, not so clear to me how it's going to go. Now, Finland, as Matti just told me, 100,000 migrants out of 5 million. Now, in Italy, for instance, there are already 10% of the population. And, uh, and so I think that uh, uh, one should think, what do we have to do to integrate them? And that takes money. Sure. <coughs> Thanks. Um, Ravi, uh, you want to add anything at the end? Um. <coughs> Shall I? Uh, yeah, uh, just a, a couple of couple of points uh, <coughs> uh, linked to some of the discussion. Uh, one is on the whole middle-income, low-income country distinction, which uh, Martin touched upon, <coughs> and I think, as he uh, uh, as he su suggested, this distinction is becoming less and less relevant in some sense. Uh, particularly, it's becoming less and less relevant in the in the in the architecture of development assistance, uh, when you have this massive sort of disconnect in some sense between where the poor live and whether the country is mid middle income or low income country. So I think we're going to have to change that architecture uh, significantly. Uh, and I think the issue is going to come up in Africa as well, because given the growth rate of the last few years, a lot of African countries are now crossing the threshold from low income to middle income countries. And they will, according to our current architecture, l begin to lose access to those concessional funds. Uh, so let's be, let's be ready for that, the, for that uh, uh, issue to arise. And I think that distinction is, is becoming less and less relevant, and we, we, need, to, we need to rethink that. Mm -hmm. My second uh, observation, and uh, perhaps this is not the time to raise a contentious issue, but I in terms of equality of opportunity and equality of outcomes, uh, the president raised it in, his, uh, in, in the paper and in his speech, and Martin also referred to it in his, uh, uh, in his talk. Um, I myself, and you know, it, it, in, in policy discourse, it's always more congenial to talk about equality of opportunity rather than equality of outcomes. Uh, somehow, equality of outcomes raises hackles of socialism and this and that, etc. And so we use the term equality of opportunity. I myself have written and I've argued that, uh, that this distinction uh, conceptually, in my view, crumbles in one's hands as you begin to use it. And as a practical matter, it crumbles in your hands. 
So if I'm going to raise resources from somebody to build those schools which are meant to raise the opportunity for the lowest, I'm going to be taxing people at the upper end who may claim they have got this because of their additional effort. Okay? So I'm actually addressing an equality of outcome issue in order to address equality of opportunity. So I must, in, as, as a practical matter, uh, I myself don't find this distinction uh, hugely, uh, hugely relevant. Um, and uh, I think it may actually lead us down a, lo a, a wrong road. But having said that, I recognize for some reason, which I don't understand, the equality opportunity term has a, has a warm glow feeling about it, whereas the equality of outcomes has this sort of, oh, well, you're going you're gonna, to uh, you're gonna tax uh, everybody to death and so on. So that's an observation that I have. Sure. <coughs> Elsie, do you want to add any? Sure. Um, just uh, two points, actually. One was uh, a question in response to the question about which models are suitable. At least from the African context, there's a lot more uh, focus on experimentation um, and coming to the, to the realization also that there's no one true model, um, with all due respect to, to the Nordic model as well. And while egalitarianism remains a principle worth pursuing, um, the reality is that actually attaining that vision uh, will require quite a bit of mixing and matching. Um, on the positive side, with respect to experimentation, something that's worth looking at is uh, the new thinking with respect to inclusive institutions, um, inclusive business models, um, and quite a bit of experimentation that's taking place also the grassroots among communities about what kinds of uh, new models of, of growth, of participation, of employment um, can, accommodate, um, or can, have, can accommodate the broader population. Thanks, Ibsen. Martin, you have any final remarks? Or? Yeah, I thought, um, yeah, going back to what President Atazari was saying and also what Amartya Sen was saying, I thought I'd say something in defense of India. Um, and I work on both these countries, as I mentioned. And um, a number of points I'd make here that I, I think it, this comparison and the way it's presented is not entirely fair to India. Um, just to quickly, um, I think initial conditions for China around 1980 were absolutely excellent. The legacy of socialism meant you had a very literate workforce, could be easily absorbed into um, the non-farm sector, a poverty reduction process that started with agrarian reform, as it always should, but in China's case it was because of political economy. But uh, a sequence of things that, that, that sort of happened that essentially meant that China over the subsequent 10 years could undo mo most of the damage that was done out of a failed economic system prior to that. Um, I think that's important. And the other side of the coin to that is that India faces, <laughs> doesn't fa didn't fa have those initial favorable initial conditions at the time its reform process started in the 80s and accelerating into the 90s. And it was always going to be a harder slog. Uh, there's no question about that. Nothing surprises me about what happened since. The second observation I'd make is ask yourself, I don't disagree that China has, has done better than India, but I would point to the differences in initial conditions again. But ask yourself, which of these two countries is capable of the biggest blunder? Which of the two countries could, could get, make the biggest mistakes, biggest mistake in economic policy? Uh, it's, I would argue it has been China. India has, did not have something as, as uh, hugely mistaken as the Great Leap Forward and the famine in 1959-61 were extraordinary. And of course, that was in the previous regime. Uh, but a, a lot of the, the I, I don't think the conditions are the same at all now, but I think India, the checks and balances, which also paralyze reform often, those checks and balances are, then are gonna come into play to, I would argue, make a huge blunder less likely at the same time possibly making um, progressive reform harder as well. There are nuances here. There's, there are different ways of looking at it, and there I think we have to be um, nuanced and uh, about the distinction in all of these country comparisons. And just going back to the, the question right at the back with the list of country models, well, what about Australia, my country? <laughs> Maybe prior to the last election. <laughs> President Arsari, please, you have the final words. Second country. <laughs> First of all, I, when I look, not only Finland, but I, when I talk about Nordic model, I, of course, include all the Nordic.
countries in that. Us last. But when I talked about opportunity, no child, and I have read very often that, that no child actually chooses his parents or her parents. So if you are born in a wealthy, prosperous family, good and well, if you are born in a poor family, would that decide your future forever? I'm not prepared to accept that. I, I think every child should be given an opportunity to improve his or her skills as much as, as possible and get a chance in, in a society. And that's why for the rest of my days I will fight for this model that we have developed over the years because it is important. Uh, I, I always think of when Chinese leaders started sending their young bright people to best universities in, in, in the world, they knew perfectly well that when they return back to China, they become change agents in that society. We start seeing it now. I remember in 97, I, my wife and I were invited by President Boris Yeltsin to Russian Karelia, and I was sitting in a sauna with Boris Yeltsin. And, uh, he had had his bypass operation and was behaving very well, <laughs> like both of us. We, we sat after the sauna on the terrace there, and he said to me that, Marty, I have decided to send 30,000 young Russians to best universities in the world. I said, I, I think it's a very wise thing to do. You see how the, what the Chinese have do, done for a long, long time. I was very sad that he died far too early, and he, that project never went ahead. But perhaps he had similar thoughts in mind when, when he, was, he was coming with that idea. I have only fond memories from that weekend as, as he and his wife's guest. The other thing which makes me optimistic is that what, what happened in the Arab Spring, when the people went to the Tahir Square and elsewhere. After that, if we who live in a democratic society don't have cuts to support people who I think made it very clear that these values that they were demanding are universal values, then I don't think we should participate in these sort of gatherings. I think it is important that when people say that we want to have proper political participation, we want freedom of, of expression, we should support them and, and support the whole idea that these values are universal as they have always been. So something very historical happened, though sometimes I say that the Arab Spring started in the suburbs of Paris when people started complaining the same issues that then later on their, their perhaps relatives and friends did in their countries where they came from. So I think opportunity is important, but I, I have also realized in my own society that that's why I'm not particularly liking the term welfare society, because it means that everything is given to you. I think it should be enough that opportunity is given to you and that the society is free and fair and it gives you a chance for good education. If you don't use that, and use all the opportunities that the society uh, offers you, then you have basically not done your duty. And I, sometimes the Nordic model or welfare society model has been criticized because of that. So let's continue our discussion. And I don't mind if somebody challenges and finds a better model that I have, I have been advocating here Please let me know. <laughs> Before that, it was very nice to be here with you. Thank you.
President Adesari, members of the panel and all who participated, thank you very much, both those here in Helsinki and virtually, and as well my colleagues at WIDER and at CMI. It's been great that this became another memorable WIDER annual lecture. May I add that at WIDER, in this building, we will actually over the next two days hold a major conference on inclusive growth in Africa and elsewhere, and the measurement and discussions on causes of poverty and inequality. I hope that you will take a look at our website. I hope that you might give it a try, follow some of the deliberation. And did you know that at the RECOM website, you can actually find all the latest about the effectiveness of foreign aid, that we have published about 90 working papers over the last eight months, and also that there is a wider angle newsletter which actually once a month provides you with the latest about global development from a wider perspective. And then you can actually also on a website find outputs, studies, information, news from no less than 11 ongoing projects on a range of issues, international food prices, climate change, new development trends and methodologies, industrial policy, and global po poverty and inequality. Now, when the next wider annual lecture will take place, we will have initiated on the 1st of January 2014 our next five-year work program on transformation, inclusion, and sustainability. I submit that those three areas, those three themes, are fundamental in trying to realize the aspirations that we've heard about here. And I do believe that approaching the various paradigms and the various models that are out there with those three areas in mind might give you some insight to what might work from the Nordic model and what might be more difficult to put into place. Please do join us. Please engage with us. And I'm happy to say that the deliber deliberations today as well as the greeting from Amatea Sen will be made available on the web, on the wider event site, and also, by the way, at YouTube. Mr. President, the panel, thank you very much.